Welcome to the Herb Gardening Seminar here at Kirby's Nursery. My name is Joey, I'm one of the owners of Kirby's Nursery along with my wife Kim, who is not unfortunately here today on our Mother's Day weekend because they moved my daughter's uh, orchestra recital to the middle of the day on Saturday. So hopefully I'll be able to make it to that in a little bit, but she couldn't be here with the girls this morning. Um, a couple things I wanted to share with you before we get started on learning all about herb gardening in Florida is that if you're on social media, Instagram or Facebook, uh, make sure to follow our hashtag, let's be more for Instagram, hashtag Kirby's Culinary Corner. Uh, we share recipes on mostly a weekly basis. We did take the month of April off, I think. Um, but we share recipes uh, for using all of these great herbs that you're going to plant. And uh, we'd love to hear some of your recipes. There's nothing we like better than a brand new exciting recipe to try out in our own kitchens. So uh, follow that on social media. Uh, we also have a website just off of our website, Kirby's Culinary Corner, uh, that has all of our uh, those recipes posted there as well. So you can check some of those out if you're looking for a little inspiration for a particular type of herb. Uh, we'll also do some fruit trees coming up pretty soon. I have a jackfruit pork that's pretty amazing. Um, so summer is coming, it's about to get hot, but that doesn't mean that the garden fund stops. So uh, make sure that you're registered for our Kirby's e-newsletter, uh, as well as our seasonal uh, snail mail mailers. Uh, you'll find out all sorts of information about events that are coming up, especially make sure you're on it for next year. Next year's our 40th birthday. We uh, start, we opened in 1980. Uh, so we're gonna have some fun stuff going on next year, especially for our 40th uh, birthday party. Um, so those are some things you can do there, but today we're here to talk about growing herbs in Florida. It can be a little challenging sometimes, but fortunately it's a little bit, it's actually, I think it's easier than vegetable gardening generally. Um, and uh, you can get a lot more out of it because you can do it 12 months out of the year. So for all of those, you know, the folks that said they were from a different place, um, the great thing about Florida is that we don't get snowed in in the winter time, right? Our herb gardens can keep on growing and actually sometimes do better, as we were talking about with cilantro. Uh, through those winter months. So today what we're going to do is I'm going to give you kind of our tips and tricks for planting, positioning, and growing herbs. That's kind of general information that would apply to all of the herbs that we have here. And then um, we're going to pass around all of these herbs. You're welcome to squeeze them, pinch them, smell them, and just, you know, enjoy the fragrance they produce. And uh, we'll talk about each one or each kind of group of herbs as we pass them around. Talk about some recipes, uses, uh, and any individual things about those herbs that might be, be different from the others. Because herbs obviously span a huge variety of different types of plants. So the first thing we're going to start with when it comes to herb gardening is we want to make sure we plant them in the right place. Where do you think that is? Sunny spot? Some sun, yeah, that's a better answer, yeah, yeah. Outside, probably a good start, right? Um, so we want our herbs to be in a part sun area is probably what we would call it. Four to eight hours of sunlight is going to be the sweet spot for planting most of your herbs. Um, morning sun is a little bit better for the herb gardens than afternoon sun. Honestly, that's almost true of any plants in Florida. Afternoon sun is just intense here. Uh, and so plants will always uh, struggle a little bit when they're just beat down all day long from hot sun. But your herb garden will thrive the best with lots of sunlight, but a little protection from the most intense part of the day. So find a spot in the yard that gets four to eight hours of good sunlight. If you start to dip below four hours, it's gonna be challenging. You may have to experiment a little with the herbs that you can plant. Mint in particular is pretty hardy for shade or sun. It's a little more adaptable. Some of the other herbs will struggle if they have too much shade. We're trying to get them to produce new leaves, right? And they produce those leaves when they can make food. They make food when they have sun. And so that's what kind of encourages them to grow and keep growing, especially since we're gonna harvest from them along the way to cook some delicious recipes. So four to eight hours of sun uh, in the morning if you, can, uh, if, if you can position them that way, that's gonna be ideal for your herb gardens. Uh, make sure that a water source is nearby. What do you think the number one thing I'm gonna tell you for taking care of your herbs is? Water them, right? That's what I, I say it in every single workshop. If you've been to one of my workshops before, I say the word water as many times as I can, just so that when you get home, you, that word is subliminally planted into your brain. So you're just like, I need to water, I need to water, I need to water. Because new plants need lots of water to get started, and they'll be the healthiest and the happiest if you get them off to a good start well. Uh, because they can grow a root system that can go a little bit longer in between uh, without as much water. So we want to make sure that that water source is nearby. Uh, you're not going to drag your hose 100 feet across the backyard to water a new herb garden every morning, are you? No. 
Um, so we want it to be a, a easy to water source nearby. That's a great place to pick in your yard. Uh, even if you have to start balancing how much sun it gets and what time of day, I'd almost rather you plant close to a hose, but in afternoon sun than away from your hose in morning sun. You're probably gonna take care of them a little bit more. Uh, make sure that it's near the kitchen. You could see it from your kitchen window if you have a kitchen window. I know that sounds kind of silly, but how many of you have ever watched fruits, fruit trees, vegetables, or herbs just sort of grow and grow and grow and you never harvest them and use them inside, right? We're all busy, right? We have busy lives. It's tough when you get to dinner time. It's like, oh, there's the McCormick. I'm just going to use that really quickly instead of going outside and harvesting those fresh herbs. My herb garden is kind of situated out of our, the, like the French doors from our kitchen. So it like stares at us. It makes us feel guilty when we don't use it. So that's a, I know it's a silly consideration, but making it as useful as possible, as practical to use as possible, I think is a great consideration when you're thinking about where to put it. Um, as I said at the beginning, outside is probably best. Yeah, you'd use the herbs more if they were sitting right on your kitchen counter. Uh, but for most of us, um, for most of us, uh, indoors is not going to be bright enough with sunlight to... Not sure what happened. Technical malfunction. I can yell if I have to, but prefer not to. Um, Indoors does not usually work well. There are obviously solutions to that. There's grow kits that have special lights that provide a spectrum of light. Um, that, uh, yeah, I can't yell loud enough over the motorcycles. I can. That's why I got the uh, speakers in the first place. Um, it, your, indoors is just gonna be tough. The lights that we have in our homes don't provide the spectrum of light that plants would need, which is a good thing because if they did, we'd get a sunburn inside all the time, wouldn't we? Um, but, uh, but you can find grow lights and different things to do that indoors, to grow the herbs indoors. That's not what this workshop, we're gonna talk about planting and growing outside. Wherever you choose, indoors, outdoors, it's gotta have plenty of good sunlight. So that number four to eight hours. The four to eight hours of, uh, of sunlight that you need, it's, it doesn't matter if it's indoors or outdoors, you still have to get that much sunlight, uh, regardless of where it is. Uh, so that's, uh, indoors is probably not the best spot for your herbs. You want to be planted outdoors more typically. Um, okay, so where are you going to plant? Not where indoors or outdoors, but in what? How many of you are going to plant in pots or containers? Okay, so we've got some containers that are going to go. Uh, how many of you are going to plant in like raised beds or something like that? That's a great way to do it. How many of you are just going to tuck them into your landscape outside, kind of mix and match? Okay. And all of those are great. The great thing is that what I'm going to talk about in terms of soil and planting is going to apply to all of those conditions. Probably the biggest difference is going to be uh, with your pots. So in the pots, you're not going to be able to, uh, you're going to have to water more frequently in containers than you would in the ground uh, where they could get established. Uh, so any, anything that you can plant in that has drainage holes at the bottom is is available for herbs. So you can be really creative. Like we have the herb boxes that we talked about with vegetables. They do really well for herbs. If you just need a nice contained space uh, to grow your uh, herb plants, and that works really well. Saves you a little bit on watering because you can, uh, you fill that reservoir at the bottom and it lasts a little bit longer. Uh, but any kind of decorative pot, terracotta, plastic, it doesn't matter what kind of material, <coughs> anything will work for your herbs uh, as well as, as well as has drainage holes. That's a real important thing. Herbs want to drain, just like most of your plants in Florida. Humidity is a big problem. Heavy rains in the summer are a big problem. If the soil drains well, uh, then that water can move on. The plant can take what it needs, but it doesn't sit sun. And so whatever you use for a container, just make sure that it has some way for that water to drain uh, out the bottom. Uh, most herbs will do well in containers, so there's not one that's really better than another. Uh, we have in particular, how many people like growing lavender? How many people had trouble growing up? Yeah. Lavender's challenging in Florida as well. It does pretty well in a container because you can control that drainage of the soil a little bit more, help it through the most humid part of the uh, of the summertime and get it to grow here in Florida a little bit better. Whether you're planting in raised beds, containers, or right into the ground, using a good soil is really important for getting our herbs started. Uh, how many people have super rich soil out in the backyard? couple people, you're super duper lucky, because that's unusual. Most of us would say sand. Uh, sugar sand, it doesn't hold any water, it doesn't hold any nutrients, 
Um, it's not terrible because the drainage is good. Even, uh, to have a heavy clay is even tougher. Uh, but the sand just doesn't do a lot for providing for our plants. So we want to amend the soil area. We are planting into a landscape condition. We want to make sure we're using good soil. And of course, we're not going to fill our containers with soil from our backyard. We're typically going to use a better soil to do that. We've got a couple of great options that we like here at Kirby's Nursery. This one's a little newer for us. It's called Happy Frog by Fox Farms. Really, really rich soil, has uh, bat guano, earthworm castings, all sorts of natural organics to make a really rich soil. We have another uh, Fox Farm soil that I did bring the bags about that it's called Ocean Forest. Um, and it has kelp meal and different things like that. So again, lots of great natural material to deliver the nutrients that those herbs need to grow in really well. Um, and then, of course, we are pretty partial to our custom blended Kirby soil. Active Florida peat, so it has microbes and things like that in it. Alice. Active microbes in that are Kirby's planting soil for good soil health that helps the herbs grow. Um, and so our Kirby's planting soil is a great good rich mix. It has pulverized pine soil in it as well, which is two things. It adds drainage, which we need because we don't want the soil to get soggy. But then it also helps retain a little bit of water. Because even though we want the soil to drain out, we want the roots to be able to get some moisture. And so those components are all in our Kirby's planting soil. That's probably our go-to typically for planting herbs, whether it's in pots, raised beds, or right into your landscape beds. Any of those uh, uh, places can take our Kirby soil as what you use. This soil is really important. Um, like what you have to do to take care of your herbs is water. Now we're going to harp on that in terms of care. But what the herbs need is a good, rich place to make contact with the roots, uh, with, for the roots to make contact with the soil so that they can pick up that water you're putting into the soil, the nutrients you're putting into the soil, um, and, uh, and make sure that they're uh, delivering to you what you want out of it. Right, so we plant landscape plants and okay, we just, we're looking for some green leaves. We don't care that much, do we? But for our herbs, what are we asking them to do? We want to be able to just constantly harvest leaves off of them and help them regrow. And not only do we want to always harvest, uh, but we want them to be full of rich nutrients and antioxidants and flavor. And most of that is delivered through the soil as the plants pick up the nutrients. So rich soil helps make a good condition in the, uh, in the ground for the plants that pick up the nutrients. We're looking for them to get to be as healthy as possible. Um, one last thing about how important soil is, is that at the end we'll talk really briefly about um, keeping our herbs happy and healthy in terms of pests and disease issues. Herbs are tough because there's not much that we can spray on an herb garden that would be safe for us in any way since we're using the leaves so regularly. So how do we combat that? We make the plants healthier in the first place. Eat plants that haven't been watered well, haven't been fertilized well, aren't taking up nutrients well, are always going to be more susceptible to disease and insect issues. Happy, healthy plants usually can push on through it and recover uh, without having to have us intervene with some kind of spread. So start them off healthy and they'll be healthier in the long run and you won't even have any issues that you really have to fight uh, down the road. So for planting our herbs, so a lot of our herbs would start in little four inch pots like the ones that we have up here. Uh, we want to take them out of their pots, of course, and then we're going to spread the roots out just a little bit. We don't want to disturb the root ball. We don't want to pull on the soil off the root ball. That's going to set the herb plant way back. But we do want to make sure that all of the roots, as much as possible, are pointing outwards. And so just with your fingertips, if you've got gloves, a little pair of clippers or something, break the outsides of the roots. So this is a little mint plant. Mint has pretty vigorous roots. So you can see that they're kind of packed in there a little bit. So just leave it just slowly. You don't have to be super meticulous, but just scrape it a little bit. You see how all these nice little white root tips, well, you probably can't see them back there, but uh, trust me, they are, uh, coming out, pointing outwards. That's the direction we want roots to grow. If you just pop a plant right in the ground out of the pot, the roots will continue kind of in the direction they've started, which is often starting to circle or at least compacted up against the uh, where the pot was. They'll keep going in that direction a little bit, and that'll create, uh, uh, eventually it'll they'll almost be root bound underground just because the roots aren't pointed outward. They'll do much better if you direct them where you want them to go uh, in the first place. So once you spread those roots out a little bit, we're going to dig a hole for the herbs. Fortunately, this isn't like fruit trees or anything like that. Fruit trees. For fruit trees. There we go. And that was so 
comes in the back and hear me again. Hopefully the other battery on this doesn't go out. <laughs> we'll see what happens. For fruit trees uh, or any of our other plants, um, we're going to dig a bigger hole, right, for a tree. For herbs, it's a little four-inch pot. We're not digging an enormous hole, uh, but we want a nice wide hole um, so that the roots have plenty of new loose material to spread out into. I would say for most of these plants, I'm usually digging a hole about eight to ten inches wide. Attempt not to dig it too deep. Whenever we talk about planting plants, we emphasize to you guys, plant them level with the existing ground. Probably the biggest mistake generally in landscaping is to plant plants too deep. We get excited with that shovel. Hey, I'm doing some good work. And we dig a nice deep hole. And then all of a sudden the plant's sitting way below the existing ground. And it doesn't really harm the plant right away. It, you don't notice it tomorrow that it's not doing well. But in a year when you wonder why it's not growing, Think back to how deep you planted it. A couple inches under that soil and it suffocates the surface roots that are there trying to get some air, can rot the trunks out a little bit. And especially for our herbs, which don't have, tend to have woody stems, they have a little more of a, uh, they call it herbaceous, so like a planty kind of stem, a softer stem, the soil up against the base of them could cause them to rot. So we want them planted level with the existing ground. And to do that, when we're digging our holes, we try not to dig them too much deeper than the root ball. Now I know, you know, two or three inches is kind of tough, so for the herbs, compensate by making sure that when you've dug the hole that you want, you've filled it in with some good soil, and now you're gonna set the plant in there. Make sure that you're setting it level, or if anything, just a little bit above the existing level of the soil around. That accounts for some settling and lets it settle to level. Uh, with most of our plants, we're gonna get heavy rains in the summertime. They want some water, they wanna get that rain through the root system, but they don't want it to puddle on them. And the second you plant a plant low and make it the low spot in an area, where's all that rain water going? It's gonna pile up right against the base of that plant. We'd much rather that water move through the soil and then move away from the plant so that they can continue to dry out. Use the water as needed, but not sit wet. Um, so everybody knows that when plants are dry, they wilt, right? What do plants do when they're too wet? They wilt, right? Uh, for new employees here at the nursery, it's always a little bit of a learning curve to see a wilted plant. What's the first thing you want to do? You want to grab a hose and soak it. But you got to check it first because sometimes when they're too wet, if it's soggy in the root system, and this happens with landscape plants, if it's really soggy in the root system, the process of osmosis that pulls water into the plant stops. It just halts. And so the plant doesn't get water, even though it's soggy and sitting in water, and so it's wilted. And so if you have a plant that you feel like you're watering and it's wilting a lot, double check and make sure it's not too soggy, uh, because that can also cause a very similar symptom uh, of the leaves wilting and looking uh, like they're drying. So we want to use uh, good soil, plant them, uh, the herbs level with the existing ground. Uh, and then when we're packing the dirt in this new soil, especially if you're doing it in a landscape bed, you can mix it 50-50 with the native soil that's there. That's absolutely fine. For the most part, in a raised bed or a container, we're going to use all good soil. But in either case, make sure that as you're planting the herb that you're removing all of the air pockets. Don't stomp it with your boots or anything like that. We don't want to go crazy. Just a light tamping down of the soil. Make sure that you remove any air pockets. You're going to water it initially. Hello, Mr. Butterfly. Are you coming to lay on a, yeah, you're going to come lay on my dill? Thank you. Um, we, uh, you want to make sure that there's no air pockets. Air pockets in a root system cause them to dry out. And then similarly, when you're watering, you're watering the plant, you keep seeing all this brown on the, the plant. It may be because a section of the roots is drying out and it's causing the plant to struggle a little bit. So get rid of all the air pockets. The initial watering that you're going to do will also help to wash that soil in and get rid of some of those air pockets as well. Okay, so we've gotten our herbs planted. We had a great location for them. We've gotten whatever we planned on planting planted. Now we need to take care of them. So what do you think we're going to do? We got to water those plants. Absolutely. It's true for all plants, uh, but especially for herbs, these are little tiny root systems. Four inch pots, barely four inches tall. That's a very small root system. Watering, the water you put on them is going to move really quickly out of that root system. Um, and so our typical rule of thumb for watering is always this. Water daily for the first month. At what time of day? Morning. I heard all mornings, right? I hope so. Uh, always water in the morning. So daily for the first month, always in the morning, about every other day for the second month, about twice a week in the third month, 
And then thereafter, for herb gardening, you're probably gonna go twice a week. Um, herbs are smaller plants, the root system is a little smaller, so it's not like a tree developing a two, three, four foot root system. They're always gonna be a little smaller, especially when it's hot in Florida, twice a week is great. You could probably get away with once a week in the winter when it cools a little and the nights are cooler. The plants aren't gonna struggle as much to keep cool during the, the day or the night, uh, which is a problem, of course, in our summertime here in Florida. The reason we water in the morning is that you always want plants to have water available to them when the sun is up. That's when they're using the water to make food and it's not during the night. And there's a huge misconception about watering in the evening. I think people sometimes think it's more efficient. The water sticks around longer and it doesn't evaporate in the daytime during, you know, during the sunny afternoon. We hear those three a lot. And unfortunately, what happens is when you water at night, the plants are wet all night long and they're not using the water. And so what happens to the roots when they're really soggy? They rot. So slowly you encourage this uh, development of root rot, root fungus, and things like that if you're watering each night. Where do you think that water has gone to by the next afternoon? Below the root system of the plant, right? Because water with gravity, it's always moving through our soil, just slowly, slowly percolating through the soil. So if you water in the evening, by the next hot afternoon, all that water you put on them is gone. What I always ask people is, uh, and you don't have to raise your hands because I know it embarrasses you, how many people have planted plants, you come home from work and it's wilted, and you water it, and it perks back up a little bit, and you go to work the next day, and you come home, and it's wilted. And so you water it again, and it perks back up, and you get into this wilt and recover cycle. So that plant is expending enormous amounts of energy just recovering each day. Switch that watering to the morning, and when you come home, the plant's gonna be nice and perky and happy. You'll water the next morning and you'll just keep it happy and it'll start to grow again. Uh, so evening waterings are, uh, in a pinch they're okay, but on a regular basis, they encourage more problems for the plant uh, than they do success. Um, so for our herbs, we wanna water them each morning. I would say as we start to get really hot, you know, do a little rain dance, hope for some afternoon rains because that helps them, especially in that first week uh, of getting through uh, being in the hot sun in the hot summer. Um, but sometimes they do need a little touch uh, of extra water in the afternoon uh, when they're brand new if you can. So uh, if you can't do that, just give them a good soaking in the morning and, and hopefully they'll start to grow that root system so that they can collect uh, more of their own water as well. In containers, like I said at the beginning, you may have to amend your kind of overall schedule a little bit. You'll start the same way watering daily. I would say that for most, for the most part, in containers, herbs are gonna need daily to every other day water through the summertime when it's really, really hot. And then you could go to two to three times per week in the cooler season. But because in a container, you're not gonna develop a natural full-grown root system, it's always gonna be a little bit smaller. You never get to kind of an established garden watering uh, if you're doing them in containers. They just need a little bit more water, more regularly in that kind of an area. All right, so we've watered our plants now. We're making sure that we're committed to taking care of them. Now we need to give them a little bit of food too because our Florida soil is just notoriously poor. Hopefully you started with a great soil that's nice and rich and has some rich materials in it, but to keep those herbs growing through harvest after harvest, we wanna make sure they've got what they need to stay nice and healthy. So there's two ways you can uh, fertilize plants. Uh, one of our favorites, especially for herbs, is because it's fast acting as a liquid fertilizer. And we've had great success this year with Fox Farms Grow Big. Lots of natural materials in it. Again, it's earthworm castings. I can't remember if that one has kelp meal and back guano. Some of that real natural material and that liquid fertilizer gets into the plant really quickly. You can do it as a foliar spray, which means you can get it on the leaves and it will absorb a little bit, as well as in the soil uh, in the ground. Uh, so you can do it both ways with that one. For a liquid fertilizer, you do that weekly. So it can just be one of your waterings uh, during the week. Cozen sprayer, you can mix that up and just water as you normally would, but you're doing it with water with fertilizer in it. Um, and then if you're a little lazier and you don't want to do it every week, you can also use a granular fertilizer. Those are typically going to be a little uh, slower acting, slower releasing, uh, which means they last longer. If you want to go organic with your herbs, the Garden Tone is a great organic product. It's really good for using on your uh, on herbs, vegetable gardens, and things like that. You'll usually use around a teaspoon. Oh, these are tiny plants. Let's go half a teaspoon on the little four inch pots. So you don't use very much. Do it monthly, um, and you could probably do it all year long for most of your herbs, because especially in the winter when we might slow down on fertilizing other plants, 
we're harvesting for Thanksgiving and Christmas, so we still want those plants to grow a little bit in that winter season. So monthly is gonna be great for the granulars. And then if you don't really, if, if organics aren't super important to you, we've got our Kirby Special Fertilizer, which is our custom blend developed by my father-in-law years and years ago, and we've kept it the same. It's got slow-release nitrogen in it. It's complete, so it's got all the minor elements as well. Magnesium, manganese, iron, and it's from the soils and fertilizers that where these herbs get all those nutrients that we're gonna end up uh, using and all the health benefits that we you know see claimed for the different herbs. So a good fertilizer will help deliver all those into the soil regularly. And like I said, monthly uh, for the granulars, half teaspoon on herbs this size. I didn't bring over any in a six inch pot. Well, here's a little bay tree in a six inch pot. So in a pot that size, you'd use about a teaspoon. And then as the herbs start to grow, you know, you got a big rosemary plant or a big sage, you could step it up to about a tablespoon. But you do want to be careful not to use too much, especially on the little plants, uh, because uh, any kind of fertilizer has the potential to burn if there's too much there. Fortunately, with things like this where there is some slow release, it doesn't release as quickly into the soil. And so the, the uh, burning won't happen as regularly, but just make sure you're using small amounts on these nice little herb plants. And lastly, for caring for our herbs, and then we'll get into the exciting part about talking about the plants themselves, uh, is to watch for insects and disease. I kind of already mentioned this. There's not, I don't even, did I bring a spray out here? Yeah, I guess I did. So I brought the neem oil out. So neem oil is derived from the neem tree. It's natural. Uh, it's, it's something you could use if you were having some major problems on your herb gardens. Generally for us at home, we have a lot of these different herbs planted and with the exception of some individual problems with things like cilantro, we'll talk about basil, uh, with, except, with the exception of some individual problems, we don't tend to have a whole lot of major issues uh, with our herbs in terms of bugs and disease. Uh, and so we don't spray, I know at home we don't spray a whole lot on our herb gardens. And it is tough because if you're picking regularly, uh, even when they're organic and natural options, it's still a chemical of some sort. And how bad do you want to have that in your salads, right? Um, so you just have to make a choice in terms of how bad the herb is with a bug issue or a disease issue uh, to think about treating. Always wash your herbs anyways when you're taking them inside because they've been outside exposed to fertilizers and different things like that. So you're gonna wash them off anyway. So something safe like neem oil is usually what we would go to and just about the only thing we would go to uh, in an herb garden for treating it for bugs and issues. Like I said, if you're doing the things I already talked about, the soil, the water, the fertilizer, most of your plants are gonna be really happy and healthy anyways. And so a few bad leaves can be picked off and thrown away. And the disease issues that could be a problem for a weak plant won't take over for a really strong plant that's nice and happy. Okay, so that is our basics for herb gardening. It's really pretty easy. You can plant stuff any time of the year, uh, 12 months out of the year here in Florida, which makes it amazing. Uh, and as we talk about some individuals, uh, we may talk about some differences between some of them. In particular, we talked about cilantro at the kind of before the workshop started. Cilantro is a really challenging herb in Florida generally. Uh, and it's often thought of it in summer dishes as opposed to winter dishes, but it grows really well here in the winter time. Uh, it can take the cold, doesn't matter if it freezes, it does even better if it's cold. Um, but what cilantro really doesn't like is the humidity. We're hot, we're humid, and it does what's called bolting really fast. It tries to flower. So cilantro is a, an annual herb. It's, it's only a one season herb generally. Uh, and so it tries to flower so quickly in the summer that you never get good leaves from it. And then the fungus issues are just tough on it because the humidity is just so hot. So if you've had problems with cilantro, you are not alone, lots of us do. Uh, but other than cilantro being a, a great winter herb as opposed to summer, everything else is pretty good for planting and growing throughout the year. As we go through them, I'll tell you annual or perennial for each one uh, so that you get an idea of which ones you need to replace on a regular basis versus which ones will be permanent. Especially if you're growing uh, in containers or raised beds, uh, that can be an important consideration because if you're going to replace the herbs each year, you may want to put them together in a particular pot or something rather than having them uh, mixed in with other perennial herbs. We do remember the difference between an annual and a perennial, right? I hope. Perennials are persistent. That's how I always tell people to remember it. Perennials will grow year after year. They bloom more than once. That, they have a much longer life cycle. For, for herbs, figure on a perennial herb living on average, let's say four to six years, something like that, before it's just gotten awfully woody. Um, some of them will live a little bit longer than that, uh, but that would probably be the average lifespan for a perennial herb. Annual herbs, and botanically an annual is something that flowers and seeds one time and that's its life cycle. Then typically once it's flowered and flowered and seeded, it's gonna die off. A couple of examples of those would be dill, 
basil and dill and basil. I think those are the only two that we have up here that are annuals. Parsley is a weird one because it's a biennial, meaning it has a two year cycle of growing leaves the first year and flowering the second year. So that's a little bit of an oddball. Um, but generally annuals have one season. What does Florida do to all things gardening? Makes it confusing. It's really confusing in Florida, isn't it? To figure out what's an annual and what's a perennial. Because things that are say annual grow all year. Things that say perennial don't grow all year. It, it can be very weird. So even what I just told you, basil is an annual. Botanically, it is an annual. It, it flowers, seeds, and that's its life cycle. But here in Florida, it just keeps on growing. Um, and so you just never know. Those classifications are sort of botanical. They don't always apply given our 12-month climate. Um, and so that can always throw you off a little bit. But why don't we start off our herbs? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass some herbs to you in the front here and then just circle them around. Feel free to squish them, smell them. If you don't want to touch them, that's fine too. But if you're here and you don't want to get your hands dirty, I'm not sure why you're here. Um, so this month, our featured herb on Kirby's Culinary Corner is mint. Uh, one of our staff members, Alice, made that delicious lemonade over there. And so I'm going to pass around a couple of different kinds of mint, and they should say what they are. So we've got a peppermint, a spearmint, and all the mints are going to have a very similar fragrance, a very similar flavor, but there are some differences as well. Spearmint itself is kind of strong, kind of powerful. I think, is that a chocolate mint or a spearmint? This might be a chocolate mint. That one's a spearmint, right? I think that might be a spearmint too, but we'll send two of them around. So there's different varieties like chocolate mint and orange mint that have a little bit of a citrusy fragrance to them. I don't know if I have any of those over here. But mints, of course, are, they're a perennial herb. One caution about mints, it can get out of control. I did it in a raised bed thinking we'd make a beautiful southern living garden with, you know, layers and so the, the mint was going to cascade out the front of our raised bed. It was going to be beautiful. And it killed my tomatoes in the back because the roots from the spearmint just grew all the way through an eight foot bed. Uh, so mint can be very vigorous. Plant it by itself. Um, I love planting mint around stepping stones or walkways because then when you step on them, you get a little bit of the fragrance of the aroma coming up towards you. That could be kind of fun. Uh, mint, of course, has lots of great uses. We had it in the lemonade today. Um, mint chocolate chip ice cream is my favorite flavor. Um, and so we use mint a lot in desserts and baked goods and things like that, a lot of mint flavoring. Uh, but mint is also really good for flavoring a lot of savory dishes as well. Um, it can kind of cut a little bit of the savory with some sweet and you'll find it in some interesting like uh, curries and sauces and things like that uh, that could be really interesting for mint. So it's a fun herb to play with a little bit. It doesn't have to just be for dessert. I totally started out of order with my, uh, my thing here. Oh, and mint pesto for with lamb is absolutely amazing. Uh, there's an example of using that kind of sweet flavor and pairing it with a, with a savory. Um, and uh, so mint also, so a lot of these herbs uh, also have some medicinal uses as well. In many instances, you can make almost all of these into a tea of one sort or another. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at different sources and they all kind of say calming effects, they'll do this and do that. So, I'm not going to go through all of the medicinal uses uh, for the different herbs unless I feel like there was something that stood out in particular. Uh, but mint can make, of course, a great tea. I mean, even just brewing a few mint leaves uh, without even a tea bag or anything could be really delicious. Uh, so mint is great for that. And supposedly beneficial for asthma, relieves congestion and things like that. So you can always make a tea for it when you're not feeling well and try that out. So those are the mints going around. And we've got some other recipes uh, on our website at Kirby's Culinary Corner. Uh, as well, if you want to check those out. What should we send around next? How about basil? Maybe I should get back onto the order of my notes here. Keep up with where we are. There's, there's basil. So we'll pass around a couple different varieties of basil. We're going to start with th uh, Thai basil. Smaller leaves, a little bit of a spicier flavor, and real pretty purple flowers. So that one's really tasty in most dishes. Basil can be used, of course, to make pesto. We found that uh, pine nuts are really expensive. Uh, and so what we'll do is make a basil walnut pesto um, and uh, mix in some spinach as well. And it's really good just adding straight to pasta uh, and things like that. And then now comes sweet basil. My favorite use of sweet basil, hands down, is a caprese salad. Fresh mozzarella, right? Heirloom tomato in a nice little slice. Big piece of basil. Sprinkle a little truffle salt and olive oil on top. I could eat that for lunch every single day. 
But often you see the uh, sweet basil, use the Italian basil, it's got the bigger leaf on it there. And that's often the one you see in a caprese salad. And then coming around, is that cinnamon or lemon basil? Cinnamon basil. So there's all sorts of different varieties of basil. I don't know if we have any lemon basil today. I don't have any up here. Um, but some of the different varieties will have a little touch of a fragrance or an aroma to them. Uh, the lemon basil has a little bit of citrus to it, which is really nice. The cinnamon basil will have a little hint of cinnamon in there. And that you could use in like baked goods and things like that, which would be really tasty. Um, well, what did we do for our, for basil month, we made a pineapple basil cocktail. It was really delicious. Uh, just a nice little sweet from the pineapple, nice and refreshing, and then that basil flavor as well. It was really, really tasty. Um, so those are some fun uses for basil. A uh, basil tea can be used to help calm stomach issues. Uh, if you have any uh, thing going on there, chew the fresh leaves and it can help a, a cough. Um, and all of these herbs, a lot of the oils have those kind of properties. A lot of them are insect repellent. Um, a lot of them just have a lot of healthy properties to them. So sometimes even just to me, the, the act of uh, taking in the herbs, you get some antioxidants and some vitamins can help you a little bit. Um, but brew a really strong basil uh, tea and then pour it into a bathtub and that can be a great stress reliever as well. We need an herb that makes the greenhouse cooler because I'm obviously sweating up here. All right, let's move to oregano. We'll stick around Italy, right? Um, oregano, lots of great flavor to that. Oregano is a little bit of a joke in my household. Anybody like Alton Brown? Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. It's a little bit of science, a little bit of cooking. It's like the sweet spot for me. Um, but we went to, my mom uh, got me tickets to see him a few years ago, and he told a joke about his wife cooked something, and he tasted it, and he said to her, huh, he needs a little oregano. And of course the look she gave him was, well, it wasn't nice. And so he told this little joke about it. So in our household, that, that line has become a joke about cooking. If, if we taste somebody's thing, we're like, oh, I could use a little oregano. I should probably not say that tomorrow since it's Mother's Day. Uh, actually, I should probably do the cooking, right? Um, but oregano has lots of great uses. Uh, pizzas and sauces, it's kind of its classic use for us. Um, one of my favorite uses that you don't see as much is to take like a tablespoon's worth and put it into a pound of ground beef when you're making hamburgers. It gives them a real earthy, uh, strong flavor that's really, really nice. Um, so that's kind of an interesting use of it. A, an oregano can be a little stronger. You don't see as many oregano teas like out there for health reasons just because it is a little bit pungent. You know, it's one thing, uh, a mint or a basil, you can pinch a leaf off and chew on it and it tastes really good. It's a little strong, but it tastes good. Oregano is a little, it's a little spicy sometimes to just do that. So a little bit better in sauces and things like that. Of course, for seasoning meats like chicken and pork, you know, take a bunch of fresh oregano and just rub it all over the outside of the chicken and cook it and you get lots of great fresh flavor uh, in with the oregano. Uh, make sure when you're using herbs and especially fresh herbs is that you'll often use a lot more of the fresh herbs than you would have dried herbs. So keep that in mind. Um, if you have a recipe that has dried herbs, you'll use more, excuse me, of the fresh herbs in your, uh, in your particular dishes that you're cooking uh, with. All right, let's keep in the same family. This one here is called savory. Very similar fragrance to oregano. A little bit of a stiffer leaf, but it can be used similarly to uh, seasoned meats and soups and sauces and things like that. And uh, then since we're kind of close, we'll move to the thyme. We have plenty of thyme, right? But here's marjoram. I don't really know what to do with marjoram. It seems like if you're gonna use marjoram, why not just use oregano? So marjoram is a milder, so if you don't like it too spicy or too hot, um, you can always substitute marjoram as a little bit of a milder. Still has great flavor, but just not quite the same zip uh, that an oregano would typically have. So there goes the marjoram. And here we've got uh, a garden thyme and a creeping thyme. I love using thyme in container gardens as the cascader to come out the front of a pot. Uh, that's a really pretty way to use it. Um, everything, so the basil was an annual. Everything else that we passed around is a perennial herb. A lot of these that we're doing now, the oregano, the thyme, and if we move to rosemary next, I don't like it to be a little bit on the dry side. Um, so they do really well in containers typically. And if you do them in the ground or a raised bed, just make sure that there is plenty of good drainage. Even if it's in a landscape bed, make sure that the drainage is adequate so that after a heavy thunderstorm, they do, do drain off really well. Did I pass this basil around and it already come back? Or did I just not do it? Well, I don't know. That one's the opal basil, completely forgot that one. Nice flavor to it, but great color as well. So if you're doing like a cool caprese salad, you use the opal basil, it gives you a little color to go with the tomatoes, which could be kind of fun. Now we'll pass rosemary around. 
We've got two kinds of rosemary. We've got the upright variety as well as the creeping rosemary. Both do really well. Both have very similar flavors, so not a whole lot of differences between them in terms of fragrance and flavor. Um, one of my favorite rosemary recipes, how many people like shrimp? I'm a crustacean fan. Um, so uh, rosemary skewered shrimps, we have like a big enough plant at our house to cut like nice big skewers off. And so we actually just use the rosemary plant as the skewer, uh, put them on the grill. You have to like rosemary a whole lot because tons of flavor gets infused into the, uh, in the shrimp. Since the skewers in the middle, like right in the middle of the shrimp, especially if you do it on the grill, the heat starts to release all those oils. You get a really, really strong flavor out of something like rosemary. So that's a really great way to use. Rosemary, oh, rosemary red potatoes. We just harvested red potatoes at our house. And so we've got fresh potatoes. They're super creamy. They came right out of our garden. And we put some rosemary and olive oil on them and bake them off. 10 times better than French fries. Um, and uh, a little bit healthier, I hope, for you. Uh, so that's another great rosemary recipe. And of course, rosemary for seasoning meats as well. Uh, things like a pork tenderloin is really great with a good rosemary coating on it to get that great flavor from rosemary in there. Rosemary, good for heartburn and gas. Uh, it can be an insect repellent. Um, so rosemary oil could be used as a, an insect repellent. You'll often see rosemary on a list when people want to try to repel mosquitoes. Um, but even with it outside, if you break off a little bit, a couple pieces get those oils released and rub a little bit on your, as long as you're not allergic, rub a little bit on yourself. Uh, you could use that uh, as well to help, hopefully, keep some of those pesky mosquitoes away. All right, we did rosemary. Let's keep in the savories here. We're going to go sage. So we got two kinds of sage coming around. The smaller leaf one is garden sage. The larger leaf is bergartian sage. Very similar flavors to those as well. Sage is definitely what I would, I don't like eating. I don't like eating just the, the fresh leaves. They have the, almost like a little too strong uh, a flavor. Um, but it's great for seasoning lots of different meats chickens and things like that great it's a great herb for winter when we get into like thanksgiving and things like that uh, for stuffings for sausage i know i have a list here it's a good thing i know what's on top of my list right yeah sage uh, uh, a sage butter sauce we cook a pumpkin ravioli in the fall that has a sage butter sauce with it it's really really tasty uh we'll make sure we put that one up when we do sage as our uh, uh, uh herb of the month and uh, sage as well, uh, like I said, used in sausages, but they're also, you can use it in sweet. Any of these herbs you can use in kind of some sweet applications as well. Um, we had a recipe we found for pumpkin sage muffins uh, that was really pretty tasty. Uh, and so you could use those. You don't always have to use them just for their typical uses as well. Uh, sage can apparently increase your concentration and focus. So that's a good thing, right? Vitamin K for bones, that can be important. Can help prevent major fluctuations in blood sugar as well. So lots of great properties from that one there. Okay, now we'll move, since we had a little visitor earlier, the butterfly, let's go ahead and do the butterfly herbs. And the reason we call them that is the next four herbs we're gonna pass around are herbs that are in the carrot family. That's gonna be your dill, fennel, parsley, and rue. But those herbs in the carrot family have one other characteristic. And that is that that butterfly that came up here, a black swallowtail, they like to lay their eggs on them. So all of those, those four plants are host plants for the black swallowtail butterflies, caterpillars. They lay their eggs. That's what the caterpillars feed on. If anybody's ever done monarchs and milkweed, those four herbs are the same, are, are to, to monarchs as what, no, or those four herbs are to black swallowtails, what the milkweed is to monarchs. Um, so that can be a little bit of a challenge in an herb garden. Like I said, we don't have a whole lot of bug issues with most of the different herbs, but here with the butterfly herbs, we have a big bug issue because once those black swallowtails start laying, they lay hundreds of eggs and they can really cover your herbs really fast. Uh, one way I try to solve that problem if I'm really uh, determined to have some of these herbs for eating is I'll try to plant some in different areas of my yard uh, and try to either move the caterpillars from like the herb garden area to the butterfly garden area, or sometimes I've found that I just have to plant my butterfly plants inside a screen or something like that to keep the butterflies away. Um, so that you, there's nothing, not much you can do to repel the, uh, the butterflies, unfortunately. They're gonna find it if it's out there. So we'll pass some of these around. Fennel is probably one of the best ones for butterflies, or at least I like it because when it really grows, it grows up to like four or five feet tall. So you get plenty of food uh, for the butterflies to, or the caterpillars rather, to feed from. But fennel's also a delicious herb in its own right. I'm gonna hand you the dill as well for that one next. Uh, fennel has a little bit of like a licorice flavor, um, so you can use it in different types of dishes, uh, but you can use it in sweet dishes for flavoring like a baked good or something like that. Um, one of my favorite recipes is uh, 
Oh, I can't. I was in Seattle somewhere. I had like a crab fennel omelet, and it was absolutely amazing. A little bit of that light flavor from the fennel, a little bit of licorice um, with the crab was pretty amazing. Uh, so either the fennel or dill with salmon is really, really tasty. I say dill especially with salmon, very, very good. Dill and uh, lemon uh, makes a little piece of salmon really, really tasty. Fennel is a perennial herb. Um, it can keep fleas away, help with digestive issues. Uh, often in fennel you see in like the spice area that the seeds are um, available and it's from this perennial fennel that you can collect and harvest the seeds from as well. Uh, and those seeds are often used in sausages and things like that for a, a pretty strong flavor. Um, the dill that's going around next, did I, is that chamomile? Can't even tell the difference myself. Here's the dill. Oh, yeah, you can pass the chamomile around, that's fine. Why not? We'll talk about it in a minute. Just remind me to talk about it now that it's not on my table anymore. So now the dill is coming around. Dill, uh, obviously classically used for pickles, great for salmon, uh, nice little flavor to it that's nice and fresh. Dill is an annual herb, so if you feel like you've struggled with dill, it's only grown for a little while for you, that's normal for it, because it is an annual. It's a little more short-lived uh, than some of, the other, some of the other herbs that we're passing around. Dill can uh, prevent insomnia, maintain bone health, and also help manage diabetes, I think with some blood sugar uh, as well. So some of the, the minerals that are in dill uh, can help with some of those things. So then we move with our butterfly herbs to the parsleys. Parsley quite sparsely. That's from Scrambled Egg Super by Dr. Seuss. Um, Parsley obviously has a lot of great uses, fresh on top of like potatoes or something. Uh, tabbouleh is one of my favorite, like a uh, Mediterranean dish. Uh, bulgur wheat, parsley, and mint, I think some lemon all mixed up together makes just a really nice fresh salad. Um, parsley, you know, you always see it as a garnish on dishes at fancy restaurants, right? It's supposed to be a, a breath cleanser uh, if you chew on a, a piece of parsley as well. So nice, uh, simple uses for parsley. Um, it, parsley is unique because it is a biennial, which we don't hear a whole lot about in the botanical world, but it has basically a two-year life cycle. Leaves in the first year, flowers in the second year is kind of the rule of thumb. So it'll behave a little bit more perennial for you, but if it starts to get some really huge size to it, sometimes the flavor of the leaves will start to get a little bit off as it moves more towards flowering than growing those new leaves. Um, and curly and flat parsley, everybody has their favorite. To me, curly's a little tougher sometimes, and the flat's a little more tender, but flavor's pretty similar uh, between the two of those. And so those wrap up our, oh no, they don't wrap up our butterfly herbs. They're only the first three. This one is rue. I encourage you just take a big deep whiff of it. And tell me what you think it smells like. I kind of think it smells like cat pee, but. <laughs> it's a little bit of a, it's a, you can tell when someone has touched the rue on like the herb table because the fragrance just travels like 20 feet. Uh, it's very strong. It's a little odd. Uh, I have yet to find a good cooking use for rue, which is why I actually love it for butterfly gardens because it is one of the hosts for the black swallowtail caterpillars. And so you can plant it in an herb garden, move the caterpillars from plants you like to plants you don't like, like the rue, let the caterpillars do what they need to and eat as much as they want. I did find, I found a few fleeting references online to rue being used in sausages in Morocco, I wanna say. And then there's an ultra fancy restaurant out in Napa Valley called, somebody said it. No, the French, yes, the French Laundry. Um, it's a super fancy restaurant, the French Laundry. Apparently someone said that they used rue in something in cooking, but I couldn't find a reference to the actual recipe. So if anybody's ever seen that recipe, let me know. Because I'd love to know a, a use for it. Uh, we do find folks...